Hello friends, welcome to another episode of Archaeologists in Quarantine. Today I'm joined with special guest Dr Chloe Duckworth, aka Archeo Duck. Hello Chloe, how are you? Hi, it's great to see you Tash, how are you doing? I'm not too bad, it's a strange times at the moment because we're in London. Um, how are you doing with everything with lockdown? Yeah, I mean we've been in tier three up here for a while so we're just kind of hanging on really. Um, and it's it's become scarily normal teaching online and working online. It's just become, you know, oh, I hate the phrase. I'm not going to say it. You know the one. But it's it has become uh, just what we're used to at this point. It is. It's just I think it's the new norm. As uh, Raven recently said, 2020 is weird. <laughs> <laughs> and, and yeah, it is. And I think this is going to be the quote now for all our archaeologists. I think, guys, if you're watching, screenshot that bit of her where she says 2020 is weird and we'll just use that everywhere. There's a dig it with Raven. <laughs> She's laughing in the background. I can hear her. <laughs> so, Chloe, I think the first thing is archaeoduck. This is how I first came across you. I think it was 2006, no, maybe 2016. I was in Egypt. I was in Cairo working at Past Preservers and I remember seeing your video pop up. So archaeoduck, how did this come about? Um, well, I, so I had, at the time I had a, a fellowship that was actually looking at, um, well, the topic that we're going to be talking about today, at glass recycling. And as part of that, I wanted to do a kind of public outreach thing. So I went to these training events and I said, oh, I'm doing this stuff with this chemical data and I'm looking at these tiny bits of Roman glass and I'm like, and they sort of went, well, you know, you're not going to get many people very interested in that. Um, and they said, you know, what, what you have to do when you want to do public engagement is zoom out of it um, and think about what's going to what's going to bring people in. What do people want to know? So I completely scrapped the idea of doing this very, very specific uh, outreach project and instead decided just to start a YouTube channel in which I kind of condensed some of the stuff that I teach as a university lecturer into little five minute, 10 minute sound bites that give people the opportunity to see how archaeology is taught in higher education. Because I, I always I always felt that a lot of the time, like what the public get of archaeology is is a bit simplified. And I think the public are smart and they want the tools that they need to engage with. So that was the aim behind it. And do you feel, I mean, there's, there's two sides to it. When they do public engagement, public <coughs> archaeology or community archaeology, there's so many different terms, the same thing, really. There's two ways. I feel like the information is, as, as you said, is dumb, 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 died, dumbified, dumb down, that's the word, dumb down. <laughs> It's, it's either very simple or it's very complex. There's like no middle ground, which is yeah. I think when I came across your channel, I was like, yes, finally, like I understand what carbon dating is, you know, simple things like this that I always knew, but I could never fully explain to somebody and show them an example online. And then you made that video, you know, about carbon dating and so many other things you've done in the past. So I think it's, it's great. And it's definitely the future of archeology. span in my opinion, I think we need to be more engaging with the public. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I totally agree with you, Tash, because I think, uh, you know, and I know that we both have this as a passion, but if you're not engaging, then who are you doing it for, really? Um, and, you know, most archaeology is funded either by private developers or by public money, which ultimately comes from people's taxes. And I think that gives us a huge responsibility to, to give back in a, in, in a more satisfying way, um, that, which I think there are so many people doing that now, which is brilliant. Mm. So from Archaeoduck, I, I understood that you were into glass, but I didn't realise, so is this your profession? This is what you study and you teach? Yeah, essentially. Well, I'm, I'm interested in ancient technology, so I will look at technology and technological change more broadly, but my particular specialism is glass. Mm, okay, so for the viewers at home, why glass in particular? Because when you think of archaeology, they think of these, you know, pottery shards like you see behind me and bones. They don't really think of glass, maybe the glass bottle, but that's about it. So oh, is please, that a pod bottle? This is, yeah, this is a cod bottle. <laughs> and we still have the marble. You can Love hear it. it. I don't know what's going to come out of this, actually. It's not cleaned. But uh, the marble's in there. 
So my, my interest in glass started because I'm, I'm keen on kind of how new technologies develop. And I think we've got quite a simplistic way of looking at that. Like we tend to look at where we are now and then we're quite anachronistic. We look back at trying to work out how we got here. Um, and that's not always the most helpful way of looking at the past. So I did my PhD on um, some of the world's earliest glass, which was in Mesopotamia and Egypt. And I was really keen on understanding why people wanted to make this material. It's difficult to make, it involves kind of transformation of things like sand into some kind of precious stone is the way they saw it. And that for me, that was really interesting. It's almost a form of alchemy that you're, you're changing one thing into another and you're creating something that is akin to something precious. So people at the time were taking precious stones um, from Afghanistan, they were trading them through Mesopotamia over the Red Sea. Um, and these things, uh, lapis lazuli in particular, this blue stone, was incredibly valuable. Um, and then people realized they could create something that was very close to this out of an artificial material. And so you might be tempted to think, well, you know, then glass is like a substitute. It's like when you buy, you know, you have like a fake diamond or something. Um, but they actually, if you examine the sources, it seems they didn't really see it that way. What they saw themselves doing when they were making glasses, they were replicating the power of the gods. So that they're, they're doing what the gods can do by creating a material ex novo out of nothing. And that really fascinated me. Um, but the way I investigated that was not only looking at the archeology, span um, I also had to do some scientific analysis of the glasses to try and understand how they were made. And that's what really got me into glass. And then since then, I've looked at the whole history of it, um, particularly Roman glass and medieval glass. And it's always this really fascinating material that's kind of at the edge of things. Like we don't value it enough. Um, when you walk into a museum, everything's behind a glass case. And it's this incredible material that's been around for three and a half thousand years, but we just look right through it, as it were. Hopefully we may inspire some future specialists in glass, I think from this conversation. <laughs> it's so fascinating what you said about, you know, them trying to mimic the gods in a sense by creating glass. It's, it's, it's interesting. I know you can get those like sort of lightning, right on the sand, and you get the, that type of glass as well. And that's something very beautiful and people try to, to use and they craft something mm -hmm. from it. I never thought about the association, you know, with something like a deity before. So it's very interesting. For our viewers at home, if you have any questions for Dr. Chloe, please send them in and we will get to them through the meantime. Um, experimental archeology. span So for my understanding of what you just said, there's like a new, discipline in itself and that's experimental archaeology it's a way that archaeologists and enthusiasts are trying to recreate certain materials or practices from the past so how have you been able to do that with glass so um the experimental side comes in again it's about understanding that technological process so what technological choices were people making how were they going from um you know, from the, the point at which they gather materials to which they produce an object. And when does technology change? Like how and why does it change? Um, so the idea behind the experimental stuff is that sometimes there are questions that the answers are gonna be limited by what's physically possible. So we use experiment to kind of work out what's physically possible. And then within that, that's the range of choice people would have had because actually our modern way of doing things is never gonna be the only way of doing it. Um, so that's why we do experimental work. And I've got some brilliant um, people in my research group. So one of my PhD students, Victoria Lucas, is she spent her, the last three years reconstructing um, Anglo-Saxon glass furnaces and then recycling glass again and again to see how many times you can actually process it and still make objects out of it. That is interesting. And that's how we get onto today's topic, which was Roman recycling. It's definitely two things I personally have not put together. But I mean, we get the roads from the Romans. We think of many other things, but I don't think recycling is one of them. So how did you even, or even your student, how did they come about looking at recycling? And I'm assuming it's important with the economy. That's the only 
the only thing I can think of. And even that actually for our viewers at home, could you maybe explain how glass helps understand the Roman economy? Yeah, so um, I mean, the recycling side of it, um, that that comes from a lot of the work that I do is around chemical analysis. So I take samples of glass and analyze them and what the materials that make it are gonna inform us on, um, on where, where those materials have come from and what kind of technological processes it's been through. So again, it's all about reconstructing that, te that technological chain of events, the sequence of events to make something. Um, but if you do that chemical analysis, then you often find that there are compositions that are maybe blurred between two compositional groups. So we start to see little bits of evidence here and there for recycling. Um, but I realized that people, although people often mentioned it in their scientific papers, you know, oh, and there's some evidence for recycling. There was very, very little work that had set focused on that recycling. So what we didn't know is how extensive it was. Um, there are a few sites where people found lots of glass that had been gathered for recycling. Um, so we know that they were doing that. And obviously, if you're looking at the volume of production, so like the Roman economy is huge. It's across a huge, vast area of land at its height. And it's about, you know, it's about metals, it's about glass, it's about foodstuffs, it's about bread, it's about everything. But we can't really look at how big things are and how interconnected they are if we've only got some of the evidence. And so the idea behind, um, well, the book is on recycling, I've, I've got it here, it's on recycling and reuse in the Roman economy. Um, it's not just about glass, it's about a whole range of materials. So like things like amphoras were being reused. So if stuff is being reused, when we're looking at the archeological remains, we're not seeing the full picture. So probably all, the economy is bigger than we think and the amount of reuse is greater than we think. Um, but just, just to say, I'm not plugging this book to buy it. This is an academic book that costs about 112 quid. So um, if people don't have access to the book and they are interested in it, then I would ask them to get in touch with me privately because I'm not here to try and make people spend <laughs> insane amounts of money. Um, but if people are generally interested in the academic kind of background to all that Roman recycling, then, then do get in touch. I just note that the auto script has described it as robot recycling, which is much cooler. Oh my gosh, it does, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. Yeah, sorry, I was a bit flabbergasted there when you said the price. Um, yeah, it's, it's the price of academic books is shocking. Um, when it goes to paperback, it'll be a bit cheaper, I should expect. But yeah, you know, I mean, it's great. It's fine for a library to pay that, but I don't think individuals should be paying it at all. Hmm. Unless there's some sort of grant system, generally speaking, yeah. There is a fine example, I think, of how, because this is out of our control, how much something costs. Um, and this is why I think it's so important for you and other individuals to make content like this, to reach the public, people who are not going to have access to this, you know, to this otherwise, or even to have like online access to certain books, unless you pay a subscription fee. Um, it's just another reason why it's so important to do public engagement, guys. <laughs> if anyone doesn't want to do it, but thinks they should, you should. <laughs> um, fantastic, though. So reuse what exactly is reuse if we could have some examples possibly yeah so um so obviously recycling i mean the way i define recycling is is really something being broken down and then reconstituted so you can recycle glass you can recycle metals you, you can melt them down um, reuse is also relevant though because one of the really fascinating chapters um, in this book comes from research um, by uh, Tom Brugmans and Alessandra Pecci. And they have looked at amphoras and they have kind of used computational simulation to model how different like amounts of reuse of amphoras would be. So it's really, really prominent because when people find an amphora, they go, oh, it's a Dressel 2. And then they, they, from that, they know what kind of contents it would have carried. They know where it's originated from. So all of our models about that massive interconnected economy are all based on assumptions that things were only used once. Um, and if they're not, if you take an amphora and you refill it with a different uh, content or you refill it with the same content but from a different location, then it throws into question everything we think we know. But even something like coins, I would think that that's, that's 
reused, right? When you have like a new emperor or, you know, more propaganda, they're going to want to remint them, aren't they? So they're... Yeah, well, the interesting thing about the Roman period is you often get debasement of coins. So um, at some points, people are melting them down and, and bulking them out with um, lower value materials, lower value metals. And then what you also see is particular emperors coming in and deliberately, um, deliberately getting the currency to be finer again. So it's, it's a really interesting question as well, because like, you know, we're, today with our sort of money, we, it's, it's, people still do forgery, but it's barely worth it. Um, because the value of most like, you know, most coins especially is, is, is relatively low in our economy. But of course people would be doing things, they'd be melting stuff down and trying to squeak. The, the empress would do that if they needed a bit of extra money. Um, so a few comments. Um, first off from Florida Public Archaeology Network. Hello and thank you for your comment. This is very interesting. In Florida, we know that indigenous people often reuse broken parts by crushing them up and adding them as tempo grog to clay to make new parts. So again, we're going to see this in throughout, I think, different parts of the world. We're going to see the same use. I think it's just putting attention on it. It's something that we don't think about. Yeah, and it's, uh, I love the grog is a fantastic one because, again, you know, it's, it's such a different attitude to waste, isn't it? Um, and, and you need a temper in your pot. You need something, if you're making a thicker pot, something that's going to withstand the heat and the different temperatures it's subjected to. So a perfect way of dealing with that, a really sensible way of dealing with that is crushing down a broken pot and adding it. Um, and there are other things people do with broken pots. They use them to practice writing on. Uh, you know, there, there are all kinds of uses for these things. And we tend to think of recycling as being, or reuse as being, we I think we tend to think of recycling as being something that happens on a very large scale. Uh, and actually, I think many people around the world, particularly in the past, but also in more traditional societies, are just, they've just got a much more ecological attitude to, to things. Um, and rather than just using vast quantities of stuff and then discarding it all, you know, we, we, when things break, we think about how we can recycle, reuse them. Mm. That's a great example. I love that one. Well, a few other comments. Um, so do, 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 let's see. So this is from Rodriguez. Hello, and thank you for your comment. Would you say that the recycling of glass indicates a waxing or a waning Roman economy? Today, I would assume it might indicate a waning economy due to a lack of resources. That's a great question as well. So we actually have some um, textual sources about recycling and they come from uh, the Flavian period, which is like the later first century AD. Um, so this is when the empire is like at its height of expansion. And what happens is glass is their like Hellenistic earlier glass is there as kind of a bit of a luxury material. And then some bright spark somewhere invents glass blowing and it takes off. Um, now the mechanisms by which that happens, we don't really know uh, yet, but suddenly glass blowing is everywhere. And what that allows you to do is it allows you to make glass vessels really, really quickly. So before that they were pouring them into molds, they had to polish them and they would be much thicker. So it's using more glass. So suddenly glass becomes something that everyone can have. Um, at least all, at least like middle-class and, you know, it's, a, it's much more widely available than it was before. Um, and so, at the same time that that happens, you get this uh, figure in the literature of this glass peddler who would go round from door to door and he'd collect all the broken glass and exchange it for sulfur um, to make matches. So it's, it's this kind of, you know, the idea of the door to door peddler um, and he would gather these things and then take them presumably to be remelted. Um, so that really is, it's not so much about the economy as a whole, but it's about that particular material about glass, which then becomes, I guess, something that, um, that is so widely available that its value suddenly goes down. Um, and there's even, there are even satires about this. So um, there's a particular one um, in the Satyricon where there's this character who's meant to be kind of nouveau riche. Like he's trying to be posh, but he doesn't quite get it. Uh, it's the best way I can put the saying. Um, and essentially he says, oh, well, I would drink out of glass because it's, um, you know, it doesn't stink like metal does. So, you know, it doesn't give a taste to the drink, but it's so cheap and common now. So the joke is that he's deliberately drinking out of metal, even though it tastes nasty, because he doesn't want to look common. 
Um, so this happens and suddenly everyone's recycling glass. But then when the Roman economy declines, um, you get people continuing to recycle the glass. And even as late as the 12th century, there are writings about people saying, um, there's a guy called Theophilus, he's a, he's a monk, and he's writing about technology. And he says, you can go to the pagan buildings, the ruined pagan buildings, and collect the glass from the mosaics and use it to color the glass that you're making. So it's something that starts in this booming economy and then people just carry on doing it, even to the extent they're going back to villa sites and taking things from them like a thousand years later. Wow. Such a shame though, they're going to the villas, but I mean, that is archeology span in itself. It's the way that we are reusing certain materials. So can't, can't criticize them too much. <laughs> of course, it'd be lovely to find like a mosaic floor and things like that, but such is life. <laughs> I guess in a way you appreciate it more if there is less of something. Yeah, I guess that's true. Yeah, the r rarity is a big part of value. Rarity, exoticism, um, yeah, big factors in how much value we give something. Yeah. Um, we had a few other questions. Uh, let's try This is from Angelina. Hey, Angelina. Let's see. Um, uh, so when it, we're talking about experimental archaeology, how often do you fail in experiments until you reach the result of how Romans made glass? And what are the main objects which have been made out of glass in the Roman times? Okay, so to the first part of that question, um, we, can never, we can never say we know how the Romans did something. What we can say is this process probably works better or this process doesn't work. Um, and one of the important things is a lot of our assumptions are based on what modern glass artists do and they tend to have gas or electrified furnaces so we use wood um, and that has different effects but ultimately experimental work can answer kind of can say that something doesn't work but just because it does doesn't mean it was done that way um, so you know it's it's an interesting one we I would never say definitively to know how anything was done um, but we can certainly narrow it down and I'm sorry, I've, I've forgotten what the second question was. I was... Ah, the second question was um, oh, the type of objects that we find that are made. Oh, yeah. So, oh, they did. They made so much out of it. Um, they made they made a lot of balls. They made a lot of tableware. So you'd be sitting down to dine or, or reclining in order to dine. And you could have um, goblets. You could have um, little bowls, um, all sorts of tablewares. And then later on, they start making lamps. So the Romans had little terracotta lamps, little um, clay lamps, uh, oil lamps. And then, but if you make a glass lamp, obviously you get a lot more light out of that one wick and one bit of flame. And so late Roman period, like fourth, fifth century, well, fourth century, and then even later in the late antiquity, fifth and sixth centuries. If you go to like uh, mosques, uh, once you get into the early medieval period, mosques, but also if you go to synagogues or churches, um, they had, they all had hanging lamps, multiple hanging lamps of glass. And so by later medieval period, you get these amazing stunning mosque lamps, which are like glass with painted enamel decoration on them. So it becomes really important in association with light, which in those religions is also associated with, with divinity. Um, so it, it, it goes from being something that's used for little perfume vessels and tablewares to being something that's really integral to, um, to like religious practices. It's really interesting how there are so many things that we have today, thanks to civilization, like, you know, to societies hundreds, thousands of years ago, sometimes, like yeah. certain things, you know, everything, as you said, from the, from a lamp, even a clay lamp to glass, something like this, this transition and to its popularity, then we go to a religious building and we see how glass is associated in such a different context, like even stained glass windows when you go past a church, mm -hmm. how important that is. I remember meeting an individual who studied uh, glass and, and how the, when the light touches it and how it reflects um, is so important and the science behind how the architects put them in certain positions is fascinating, it really is. Yeah, um, and I, do you know, I love how um, if, you, if you look at a wine glass from about the fifth century AD, 
Mm. It's really not that different to a wine glass that we have today. Mm. So that's the form. You know, we talk about typologies in archaeology and how the form of things changes over time. So a form that's changed very little for 1500 years because it works. Like you don't need to do much. It just works as it is. Brilliant. Guys, I hope at home you're like starting to look in your house and even if and when you get to go outside, you see like so many things around us are filled with history. Even if it was only made five years ago, there's some sort of connection there. So I hope you start thinking a bit more. It's really fascinating. Um, da -da -da, let's see. Um, okay. Okay, another question from Angelina. Can you distinguish between um, cultures, ah, can you distinguish between um, objects from the Celts or other German tribes made to Roman glassware? Um, yeah, so there's, there's um, well, it's interesting. So um, you have kind of Celtic glass. They were making, they were really big on making these really gorgeous uh, blue glass bangles. I feel like I've got one somewhere. I'm trying to think where it is. It might be in my office actually. Um, so they had their kind of uh, their own glass making traditions. And then the Romans have their glass blowing. And actually what you get is right on the edge of the Roman Empire, the bit of Roman Empire that actually encroached into modern day Germany, you get these really major glass houses. So like in Cologne, so they're, ma they're making glassware there. Um, and I think once, once the Romans start doing that, then people are trading with them. People from outside the empire will trade with them. But there's a, there's a pre-Roman tradition of making glass beads, making glass bangles, like per, personal ornaments, basically. Mm, fantastic. And for viewers at home, don't forget to like and comment on the video itself and to follow Archaeoduct Socials, which is all in the description box, especially her YouTube channel. You'll love the videos that she has. And also I did say to people, get in touch with me. If you type Chloe Duckworth into Google, you can find my university page, which has my email address on it. Um, so yeah, we can maybe link to that as well. Brilliant. I think actually, did I put it? I might have put it in the description box. I can't remember actually. I, I made sure all your socials are in there. I made sure the YouTube channel was. <laughs> it's the most important thing. All those videos, they're fantastic videos, guys, seriously. Um, jim, jim, jim. Let's see, next question. <laughs> from potted apprentice yes it is fascinating stuff and he's loving all the pottery chat too <laughs> always got to bring pottery in we, we know where without pottery that's the first big pyro technology apart from cooking so it's true i mean we owe a lot to pottery um and especially in the archaeological context it's one of the first things generally speaking is other glass or pottery shards that we find and we're like yep okay we know roughly what age you know, we have a, an age bracket, a period of time that we're looking at. So it's very useful. Um, okay, next question. Ah, okay. Another question is, at which point of time did the Romans start making glass items? I'm guessing it was roughly the period when they started interacting with Egypt. Um, so the, so at this point, um, Egypt, Egypt was a huge kind of vector in, in glass technology, but I think someone asked right at the start actually when, because I was talking about the earliest glass making, I didn't say when it was. So it oh, starts yeah. in around the 16th century BC. So um, basically the second millennium BC, and it starts in probably Northern Mesopotamia. So like modern day Syria. And then it gets, that technology then gets taken to Egypt. There's some idea that it was even taken there by captured craftspeople on one of the foreign campaigns of the Egyptians. Cause obviously, well, at this is not obvious, but at this time you've got all these massive empires all competing for space um, in Western Asia and the East Mediterranean. And then it goes to Greece. And then what we see the next kind of evidence, archeological evidence of glass spreading further out from those locations. Um, we see glass going uh, to India and also going to Italy and then up through um, other parts of Europe. Um, and so what, what it looks like is that probably the technology is, is spreading um, from kind of from that initial invention point. So by the time you get to the Roman period, uh, we had widespread glass, uh, but certainly in the Hellenistic period, which is just before the Roman period, um, Egypt was a big center of glass making um, and Alexandria particular, 
particularly uh, was where a lot of the finest glass was made. So Egypt's a huge influence. And interestingly, there's probably an independent invention of glass in West Africa as well. So there's a, there's a, a tradition of glass making there from I think about the 10th, 11th century um, AD as well. So again, it's something that we find in multiple um, places. You get a lot of Indian glass is really important. We have a Pacific Ocean, uh, sorry, uh, an Indian Ocean trade. There is later a Pacific Ocean trade, Indian Ocean trade of glass quite early on. So how that technology moves from one place to another and where it's independently invented is something I think is really interesting. I think you're going to inspire some future students <laughs> at this rate. It's fascinating when you speak about glass and even how trade is one of the most, I would say, the things that we kind of focus on in archaeology, anthropology and other sciences and humanities, that we are looking at trade a lot. It helps us understand the interactions of different cultures and epochs over time. Something like glass, though, I don't think people really put attention on. Again, it's pottery or coins yeah. is something that we focus on, in my opinion. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I think, oh, excuse me, I'm opening a Coke because <laughs> I'm not advertising it. It could be a generic fizzy drink. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, there's, so there's, when you look at, when you kind of move ahead in time um, to the sort of 16th century AD, and then we start to get kind of worldwide trade, there's this huge trade in glass beads. Um, and, and that's really interesting as well, because that's an example of people from all different parts of the world. So, um, but particularly from um, West Africa and also from North America, where people are really interested in getting glass beads. So the European traders begin to make them. And what they make in Europe is made to the taste of the people they're trading with. So the European kind of glass production gets dictated really by people with whom they're trading. But obviously in that context of colonialism, they, the Europeans had a very patronizing attitude towards it. Um, and so, you know, they would say, oh, well, you know, we, we bought Manhattan Island for a thousand glass beads or something. Um, but of course, you know, they, they ultimately believe that gold is incredibly intrinsically valuable. So you have two different value systems clashing up against each other. Um, and the Europeans sort of look at one and go, huh, they value this. But then, you know, they value gold, which is equally as ridiculous if, if you want to see it as being ridiculous. So I think it's really interesting in that, in that later context, how beads are traveling, beads are traveling around the world, but they have different meanings to everybody who is using them and trading them. And I think with beads, I I'm guessing in context of like a burial, maybe it's the beads you might actually find in a, in a burial site. And maybe is that one of the earliest examples that we find grave goods? Is it beads? Yeah, um, yeah glass beads are, glass beads are um, from quite early on in certain cultures, um, they, will be, they will be grave goods, yeah. So um, another one of my students, um, Ellie Montanari, who, who you know as well, Tash, um, she's looking at Iron Age uh, glass beads in, in Italy and how they relate to things like gender and childhood. So again, you know, you know this old thing that we say in archeology, span we say the dead don't bury themselves. So the way that somebody's dressed for death, the way that somebody's buried is all about, it's reflecting that society and that culture. Mm. So fascinating. Okay, um, we have a few more questions. Uh, let's go with this one. Okay, so when we think of the Roman Empire, we're going to think of the how huge an army is, right? But how is that in relation, if it's possible to say, with the large quantity of glass found across the empire? Can we associate that with the movement of the army? Oh, with yeah. The empire itself? yeah. I think so. Um, I think just as with many things with the Roman economy, that the army is a huge vector in that. It's a huge factor in that. So um you get the army it, it creates a monetary economy it creates a, a drive for surplus goods and so you do tend to see um more local production towards the limes the limits of the roman empire and i think you and i actually have experienced that when we were working on hadrian's wall together 
Yeah. Um, and we found some quite fancy fragments of fancy glass there as well. We did, <laughs> which you may learn about later on next year, <laughs> mid next year. Yes, it's December now, so next year. But let's hope, yeah, let's hope it's next year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was a great question from Alex. Thank you very much. Um, a few more. If you have any questions, please send them in now because we're coming up towards the end of the stream. We've been going for 45 minutes. Can you believe time flies? Time actually, I talk a lot, don't I? I do talk a lot, it's terrible. No, I, I think we're all enjoying it right now, to be honest. And I'm actually glad that we're doing it in this format because it's actually, we get to really focus on what other people want to know as well. Um, I think it's, yeah, it's great. There's been great questions, by the way. I'm really pleased with the questions. I did not, I'm nothing to do with this. I'm just sitting here and reading. <laughs> They're brilliant questions, yeah. See, there are so many people out there, Chloe, who love glass. You need to do more Archaeoduck glass videos. I, I think. think I will, yeah, I think I must. Yeah, you must, this, this, you know, this holiday season, that's what you need to do. Spend your time on that. <laughs> Uh, okay. Okay, another question. Do, 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 have I read this one? Didn't, oh, yeah, that one's done. Okay. Um, are there many historical records that describe the process for glass making during Roman times, or is most of what we know from archaeology and experimentation? Great question. Um, they, the Romans weren't really that fussed about writing down technological processes, so we don't get much, but we do have something from Pliny the Elder. That was the Pliny that was uh, killed in the eruption of Pompeii. And he wrote this big natural history. And in it, he gathered together sources from all over the place, probably a number of written sources that have been lost to us as well. And he describes this story, which is apocryphal. It's not true um, because you can't make glass in this way. But it shows that people understood kind of something of how glass was made. So he says that some Phoenician sailors were camping on the beach overnight, and it's the beach of the River Belus, which is um, in the East Mediterranean, it's on the uh, Syro Palestinian coast, and it's a great beach, got perfect glass making sand there. So he says they camp on this beach and they've got these soda cakes that they're trading, and they use the soda cakes to light a fire, and from the fire, this liquid pours forth. Now, those soda cakes, soda and sand are the two main things you need to put together because. You can't really melt sand unless you have like a lightning bolt, like you mentioned, it needs really high temperatures. So the soda lowers that melting temperature. So he knew what glass was made from. Um, and indeed Roman glass in that time was all made using this natron stuff. So that's about it. That's about as much as we get. Um, and then people endlessly debate uh, the little details of where he says glass was made and you know how much that links with what we know archeologically. The only other thing we've got is one of the little ceramic lamps, about this big, it's a ceramic lamp, and it just has a crude depiction on it of two people at a furnace blowing glass. And that's the earliest image that we have to show a furnace. And if you think about how stuff survives archeologically, the most that we get really from a glass furnace is the, the bit that was the substructure. So the base of the wall or whatever was dug into the ground. So that's, that's the, our only evidence for thousands of years of what the top of that might have looked like. And that's it, everything else from archeology, span from archeological science um, and from doing experiments. Wow, I think maybe we could show them just a little clip from your video, which is um, how, how we make Roman glass, which is based at a experimental archeology span facility in Germany, I think it was, I'm going by memory. <laughs> so let me just see and I'm going to show you a little clip because this is from Chloe's YouTube channel so you can watch the whole video the link is in the description already which I recommend you to watch straight after the stream if you're still interested in learning more about glass archaeology today um so I will quickly share Ooh, nope not that one where is it gone this one so I will quickly share if it allows me to, but it's it not right now. Uh, let's close that. Apologies, one moment. Technical. I love 
like computers, right? <laughs> this is why I deal with past technologies and not current, right? Let's try again. Hopefully everybody can now see this. Okay, so this is yeah. So this is your channel. So I'm gonna quickly have a look. As you can see, it's Archeo Duck, Duck for Duckworth, I assume. <laughs> which <Yes>. is awesome. <laughs> uh, right. Uh, which I just realized we never actually said. So people might not like know why you're Archeo Duck. <laughs> okay, so this is the beginning of it. I would move, I would move free to the middle, actually, I think. Yeah, let's the... move to the middle. Oh, this is uh, so cool. Uh, yeah, which comes from an oil land and also the archaeological records of the excavations. Uh, but they are mostly featuring just the outlines of premises. Mm -hmm. So these are the furnaces, right? I've just muted it. So here we can actually see what they've created. Yeah, they're incredible. Um, this one, I can't remember what they called it. They gave them all names, um, but it's an absolute monster and it can take uh, kilos and kilos of glass. So you can work it for a week with four glass artisans working at it. And they, they keep them at temperature all the time because you need to keep the glass hot for a long time to keep it at the right consistency to work it. So that meant staying up overnight to stoke it. Mm. Um, it's you know it's dirty in there it's smoky it's hot it's really amazing actually that you have these you know these individuals who are just putting everything into it as you said they're staying up all night taking it in turns what's he doing right now this is the blowing yeah so this is he's he just gathered that glass there and then He's swinging it. So he, this, this glass blower told me that the main tool of the glass blower is gravity. Um, because obviously the glass, it, it wants to obey gravity. It wants to drip. So they tend to get very good at swinging it around. The way that they move it um, is, is, is kind of, it's almost like a dance. And it's, it's very kind of, it's very mesmerizing to watch. It really is amazing. I'm and not I can tell show you, me. this is so difficult, like it's so difficult to do. Um, and, you know, they're experts, they make it look easy, but it, it is a thing that you could take a lifetime learning. Have you tried doing it? I have, yeah. And uh, I think I made a sort of splat. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So this is one of the students who was, you know, one of the people that was staying up all night to stoke the uh, stoke the furnaces and keep them at the high temperature. And is this showing the temperature there, those little gizmos there? That's right, yeah. So those are purely for recording the temperatures. Um, people in the Roman times obviously wouldn't have had those, so they'd go by the colour of the flame and they'd also go by the consistency of the glass. So they'd probably be able, I don't know what language they would have used, but they would have had quite a sophisticated language for the different temperatures. Brilliant. I'm not gonna show any more because you can watch the full video <laughs> on Archaeoduct's channel, which I have put in the link. Let me just actually find us now. So hopefully I've actually stopped sharing that. Um, Chloe, before we go, anything that you'd like to add is maybe a little bit more about summarising, um, you know, Roman glass in reuse and recycling, just to, you know, one more time to hit it out there, as I guess we didn't really cover it that much, did we? Yeah, well, I think, I think we had some really interesting conversations, so I'm absolutely fine with that. Um, in terms of recycling, I think, you know, let's just, let's look at recycling from a new perspective. When we, when we look at recycling today, it's a huge part of the global economy, but it's always one that gets shoved to the side. Um, and it's, you know, we tend to see it as a very kind of altruistic thing, but 
it's not always that way. So often what we do is we ship out recycling to countries where people um, have, don't have great working conditions and don't get paid very well. And so there's a whole thing with the textile industry about that. And in the Roman times, it was kind of similar. Um, you know, it, from the textual sources that we have, it's likely that people who are involved in recycling didn't get much money out of it. They're probably living kind of on the edges of society. So it's really interesting how recycling has always existed, but it's just not necessarily something that we, we talk about or think about very much. It's, yeah, and for any students out there who don't know what to specialize, maybe they would like to do a master's or they're thinking about a PhD topic, what would you like to say to them? <laughs> I would say, do the thing that makes your heart sing. And if you've decided from watching this, that's glass, that would be brilliant. But um, it's worth taking the time to, don't just assume that whatever you did at school or whatever you did in your undergraduate is the only thing out there. Cause I discovered a whole world of fascinating stuff about glass that I had no idea existed. Um, and I'm so glad I did. That is brilliant. On that note, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you today, Chloe as always. And for it's, been, it's been great. It's been what, a couple of months? It's really good to catch up with you. Yeah, it's true. It's been a while, actually. It has been a while. And uh, for our viewers at home, if you have any questions for Chloe, I've left all her information in the description box below. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe this video and like both of our YouTube channels. Hit that follow button, hit that notification bell and even our Instagrams. Chloe's more on Twitter. I'm more on Instagram. I don't get Twitter that much. Too, it's too much for me, I think. <laughs> but on that note, again, thank you all for tuning in. Tomorrow we have a special live stream, all in you know the winter solstice vibe. So please look at the YouTube channel. We'll be putting more information out there soon. And on that note, see you all tomorrow. <laughs> Bye. I'm so excited for tomorrow.